pray. Father, we are overwhelmed by your holiness. That one so holy, the only holy one, the only perfect, eternal, immutable one, should love thee to send his only son to die on the cross for me, and apart from whom I have no hope at all. Father, we bless your holy name, and as we come into the sanctuary this morning, we thank you that you have granted us the permission to do so on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, who has washed away all our filthy stain. We pray thank you. We bless you. We pray in Jesus' name. Remain standing and turn to your hymnal, the hymn number 272, The Solid Rock. 272.
Good morning, church. I noticed some of you singing really well this morning, and some of you must not be feeling too good this morning. But I don't know, that music pumped me up something vicious this morning. Thank you, Joe, for playing, and they were good songs, and, and oh boy. I'm pumped this morning. I'm pumped. I'm glad here to be with you. I'm glad to be here with you. And uh, <laughs> I guess I am. But one thing I wanted to notice before we proceed much further is that it indeed is Veterans Day. And actually, a hundred years ago, the armistice was signed, uh, ending the First World War. It wasn't a surrender, it was an armistice, which is different from a surrender. Uh, at any rate, there have been men and women who have served our country by the millions since that time in ensuing conflicts, even in peacetime. This morning, I'd like to pray for those veterans who are in our midst. I know of one over here on my left, actually two. I just met Nikki. he's served in Vietnam. And Eric, I think he served in a hot car somewhere around Norfolk, Virginia in the Navy, I think he was in. At least that's what he says, and I'll take his word for it, is uh, I know that I, and Edgar, served in the military and found his wife because of that. Praise God. Um, faithful um, marriage for all those many years. Has someone else been in, Dick, have you been in the service? Somebody else been in the service that I don't know about in here? My husband was in. Wow. That sounds like Edgar. He was in two branch. No, yes, he was in two branches of service, wasn't he? Didn't he say that to his era? I think so. I think so. It was Army and something else, I forget, but yeah. John was in the Navy. John was in the Navy in World War II, and then he helped uh, teach uh, in Saint Beads in the Vietnam. Uh come on. Really? Wow. Every family we know basically is touched, especially in a rural community like Mount Morris, um, by the knowledge of people we know who have gone into the military to serve the country, to serve us, and everybody knows somebody. And it's kind of a shame, this is the only time of the year really where we spend any time even beginning to think about the sacrifice that so many people have made, whether they gave the ultimate sacrifice or just sacrificed four years of their life in service. It's still a sacrifice. It shouldn't be about my two sons. Harold was in the Navy and Russell was in the Army. Yeah, see? And I had a son in the Army. Son in the Army. Certainly there are opportunities to be afforded to young people by going into the military service. But sometimes the sacrifice is something that we overlook. We were talking, Babs and I were talking about a young couple uh, who just, after, it's not anybody I know, they'd known each other for a month and got married in a hurry because they were both going to basic training. And I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like a good foundation for a decent relationship. But that's what they did. But anyway. What I'd like to do is pray for our veterans this morning before we continue. And I want to also pray for Barb. Uh, she's leaving on Tuesday for Guyana. I, I never know whether it's Guyana or Guyana. Or, it's down in South America. It's down there. It's down there. It's south of us and it will be warmer. Yes, down there. And I can pray for my family as they travel back to Pennsylvania. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Well, let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning. We come before you with deep appreciation that you, by your grace, your common grace, and your providence, has placed us in this country, in this time, a people who are free and democratic, a people who have liberty to pursue their own happiness, people who have liberty to worship without fear of retribution or punishment, people who are free. Father, but it is nothing 
compared to the freedom we have in Jesus Christ to be set free from the condemnation of sin. We praise your holy name. But even as in order for us to be set free, it was necessary that blood be shed, the blood of our precious Savior Jesus Christ. We recognize that our freedom as citizens of this country has been purchased by blood. We thank you. We praise you that there have been men and, men and women over 200 years who have fought to deliver us freedom, security, liberty, and have shed their blood on the battlefields either at home, here, or the battlefields in foreign nations. Father, we pray for them. We pray thank you for each and every one of them, for these men and uh, uh, others who are family members, Donna's family and, and Linda's, and people who have served, and John Seifred, and probably we could make a long list if we spend the time, and we probably should, at least in our own homes. And thank you, Father, for raising them up to serve. We know, even as for those of us who watch television from time to time, we know that veterans that come home from Afghanistan and Iraq suffer some of the worst injuries, at least visible ones, of missing limbs, of trauma, of post-traumatic stress syndrome. Father, those are sometimes new to us, but they're graphic to us when we see young men and women who have lost both legs and still survive. And yet they gave those legs and shed that blood for me and you. Thank you for that. We thank you for the men who, and women who served in Vietnam and who come back with long-lasting wounds. We pray for your healing in those lives. Men who, women who came back from Vietnam to face angry crowds of protesters. We pray, Father, that you would honor them by healing them inside and out. Father, we thank you for each and every one of them. And we thank you, Father, too, that we have in our midst a number of veterans that we can only pray and thank, pray for and thank wish we could do more. I wish we could be a, bring healing to brokenness, but only you can do that, and we ask that you might. Father, I pray as we think of others who serve, we pray for Barb right now. As Barb prepares to leave, I pray that you will help her pack her suitcases efficiently, that you will help her to have planned this out well, that it will be an adventure of God's potential. We thank, I thank you. I, I got to tell you, Father, she encourages me and encourages each one of us because when you're in the ministry, when you're a Christian, you never retire. Get over it. You're always going to be in the ministry, ministering to people, bringing the gospel to people. That's all of our job. But Father, I thank you for her specifically. She's willing to take off to a South American country that nobody has ever heard of, and we're not sure if it really exists, but we'll take a word for it. But we pray, Father, that you would give her especially gracious journey mercies, both down and back, that her connections are smooth, that she is able to, to pass through customs easily, that, Father, you would just go ahead of her with a multitude of angels and clear her path, clear her path to the classes she's going to teach and lead so that there might be multitudes of people who are trained in sharing the gospel with children who will lead multitudes of children in Vienna to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that there will be multitudes of children and their children and their great-grandchildren who will know Jesus Christ because of her faithfulness who said, yes, Lord, here I am. Send me. I thank you for her. It's stirring to my soul. Father, I pray your blessing as we look at your word. 
And I pray that you would meet with us. Father, I thank you as well. One last parting word in prayer. I thank you for the ladies of our church. They are the most remarkable group, all considered. A white, diverse group who have such tender hearts, who have sought to reach out to the family of Sarah Gray and to Sarah herself. What a testimony to you in their lives, to those who are hurting who are needy, who are broken, who are hurting. Thank you for their response. Thank you for their willingness to go way out of their way to help. We praise you for each and every, every single one of them. Father, we pray meet with us now and open your word to our eyes and our minds and our hearts that we might grow in Christ's name. Amen. Oh. I'm just happy to be here. I don't know about you all, but I just think this is a grand all place. And I don't know, I came in here this morning. I broke the copier first thing. That always distracts me. There was snow on the steps. And that, uh, I figured I better scrape that off before Louise, no, before, well, Louise. I didn't want Louise to come tripping up the steps, but I was afraid Donna might have a hard time. Lynn had already navigated the steps, and I was sure Lucy was going to give me an earful if there was still snow and ice on there. So I scraped it off, threw a little salt down there, and then I went in to work on the computer and probably broke it. I think Tim had something to do with it because he was in there with me. So I'm going to blame Tim on the brokenness of the copier. Anyway, uh, it's been a good morning. It really has. I'm complaining. I'm so appreciative of Joan, as always. She's away. I sent her the passage and uh, sort of a broad title, which she's like, oh, what's that supposed to be about? And she comes out every week with some of the most wonderful, powerful songs that fit. And I appreciate that. That's just a God thing. Thank you. And I think, I think this is where you belong. <laughs> thank you for singing. Donna, thank you. Uh, reminder that there is no official prayer this week because there's a business meeting, so everybody show up and have a good time. Uh, it'll be great. We're in First Peter, and uh, oh my word! And uh, and so we're going to be very uh, few of words this morning. But at the sign out front, if you notice the coming in, I sometimes have a hard time figuring out what's to put there. It obviously is not attracting a lot of people. Um, <laughs> but that's okay. At least people come by and from none day and come that direction and they say, Oh yeah, I saw your sign out there. You ever want to stop by? No. <laughs> but it's like, okay, well at least they know we're here. The doors are open. It's wonderful. But on the sign, if you noticed it, I said, Here is where hope is found. I believe that to be true because in this book is where hope is. Amen. But I'm just wondering, what do y'all hope for? Please kind of just give me an idea. What what do you hope for? You have any hopes, dreams? Well, no, let's leave it to hopes. Just leave it that one word. Any hope? What's your hopes? My hope is in the Lord. My hope is in the Lord. My hope is in the Lord. Yeah, that's a great old song, and it's true. <coughs> Anything else you hope for? Thank you. Now you're getting the idea. It's moving. Salvation for our grandchildren. If you all have grandchildren and they don't know the Lord Jesus yet, that's more than a hope. That's a plea before God, isn't it? You know. Anything else you hope for? This church should be full with children. This church should be full with children. That's not just a hope, but it's a plea, God. Would you help us fill this church with children? Oh, yeah. What else do we hope for? I'm sure you must have other hopes, too. I hope that I would live my life um, that others can see Christ every day. Amen. That's a, that's a daily, moment-by-moment -moment hope. Well, I'll tell you what. I say that. Frequently, because I don't so frequently 
do what I hope for in being a testimony. It's a failure of the flesh and sin. I admit it, I confess it, I repent of it, and I have to do it constantly. I'm sorry. It's me. Anything else we hope for? I would say that uh, for the Lord to help us all, uh, because we're all included in this, that help us to be patient. And uh, patience is, uh, is, is something that I think is very important. It helps us to be patient in uh, the Lord as He continues, as He said, tells us in His Word, to continue, as He continues to work, as He continues to, uh, His good work in us, and I knew that, you know, why He will. I'm trying to think of the scripture that says that he who began to be working is what I'm trying to say. We will be faithful to complete it mm -hmm. until the dead of Christ Jesus. But we'll be patient as he completes the good work in us. Amen. Hope that uh, we can wait patiently. Yes. Are we impatient people? Yes. I am. If you live in Buffalo and you root for the Buffalo Bills, you, that's an exercise in futility and patience. I may never again get back to the playoffs. Not that I really care, but I follow them just because I live in Western New York. Pastor was going to share. I hope we can put you out of work. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the pastor who loves God, who loves the Word of God, who love these people, preach the Word, and love the community and being here and seeing all the wonderful opportunities that are here. Amen. That's a hope every one of us has. I wouldn't mind being put out of this job. I don't look forward to being ever put out of this church. <laughs> You've tolerated me this long, and I have said it occasionally to those who will listen. The only reason you kept me is because you love babs. So, <laughs> and that's okay, Barbie. I love her too. Anyway, as we think about things we hope for uh, in this passage, actually, the reason why we, we may look at this passage again next week, frankly, it is power packed with stuff that just, it just keeps coming at you. It keeps coming at you. It's like, I mean, here's, when I prayed for Barb, and you have too, what are you praying? You pray that in hopes and anticipation that God will use her in a mighty way in her training of others to lead children to Christ, whatever techniques she uses in puppets and, and muppets and whatever they are, you know. And uh, um, those are scary things to me, by the way. I, they're like clowns. Anyway. Um, in this passage, actually we're going to back up to verse 3 of chapter 1. And here I go on an outline that we'll get maybe uh, uh, through number 1 on. I guess I don't really care about hurrying through God's Word, to be honest with you. Um, when I was in, uh, first started on campus, one of the professors, Dal Cable team, uh, had a Bible study for college students. And he, I went to support him, to support the students that were going. He started in the Book of Romans. And I went in uh, November, finally started going, is when I was free to do that. And uh, he was still on chapter one in November. It started at the beginning of September. And I was like, what? <laughs> and by Christmas, we were still in chapter one. And beginning of the spring semester, he started chapter two and simply never finished it because it was such a rich couple of chapters, like Eddie's chapters of the Bible. No point in rushing. So unless you're impatient to get through First Peter, pray that you will have patience and we'll get to it eventually. Anyway, verse three. It's one thing to have hope for something. It's another thing to have hope in something. If you're rock climbing or repelling, you have hope that your equipment is sound and is sturdy, that your ropes are not frayed, and that you won't fall when you're 150 feet up on the side of a cliff. If you're driving a car, you hope 
that someone in Detroit, I use that stereotypically, put all the parts together in the right place, in the right order, and tightened everything down. Because if they didn't, what's likely to happen? You put your life in jeopardy. You hope for a lot of those I do. Uh, that's why I don't fly in an airplane any more than necessary. That is, has more serious consequences if failure should occur. And anyway, I don't know who the guy is that's driving that airplane. I don't have a lot of hope in him. I'll never even know his name or his credentials. I just hope he's the real pilot and he's sober. <laughs> well, that's not the scary part of I know you're flying. <laughs> But scripture says this, and it's so wonderful. And, and I love it, because it is hope that's unshakable. And this is what gets me jumping and jiving. How do people in this world go through life without any certainty of hope? No certainty of promise. How do people do that? How do you just hope that things are gonna turn out all right? When you talk to people who do not know Jesus and they and you say, wouldn't you like to know your eternal destiny? Well, I'm a good person. I hope God will accept me. Wait, well, where do you get the eye that hope from that God will let you into heaven? Because you're a good guy? Have you ever looked at God's word to know what the standard for good people is? But frankly, good people don't get into heaven. Only those covered by the blood of the man. So as we, uh, boy, I just get to crank up. I can't chew. Um, I think again, it's Tim's fault. Tim was kind of wired this morning, and I like that. He, he kind of juices me up too. But in verse three, he says of chapter one, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy, mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope." by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Lively hope. This is not just some facade. Every one of you here have a lively hope. It means your hope is alive. Why is that? Because Jesus Christ is alive. Woohoo! And we know this to be true, amen? And there's nothing that can rob us of that truth. And because He is alive, we have a lively hope. It's not a hope like, I sure hope so. I sure hope this is going to work out. You know? It's like, no. Hope is a certainty in Scripture. If you have a hope that's born out of Scripture, it's immutable. It's unchangeable. It's absolute. It's take it to the bank. True. It will never change. And so when God says, this is so wonderful, so marvelous, it's a live in hope. If you run into people who are like Eeyore, you all know who I'm talking about, Eeyore? Most of you do anyway. Eeyore is like, whoa, me. <laughs> How are you? Well, you know, I'm not having a very good day. And they go on, and it's like, no, me. And, well, what's wrong? Oh, it's life. Well, no, Christians, I'm sorry, but if you're not feeling the liveliness of Christ in you to produce good fruit, then you are missing something substantial. Because God says, through Peter, you have a lively hope because of his abundant mercy. Boy, I'll tell you, well, now I don't advocate bouncing off the walls, although I've done that, uh, literally, from time to time at Super Bowl parties with my college students. <laughs> it was quite a scene. But uh, <laughs> we had, we should, there should be a certain energy level, a certain spiritual perspective, a, 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 an eyesight, a vision that says, oh, I'm having a horrible day. I just hope my car doesn't break down. I hope my wife doesn't crash the car again now that it's repaired. I hope that she doesn't drive over the curb with my son's van again and pull the front bumper off. I hope she does. I don't know what I'm... Oh, my wife. You know. Well, she ain't perfect. But you know what? She married a far more imperfect man. 
And then she points it out. <laughs> but what is, I, I, it's, it's, it makes you ecstatic once you begin to be embraced by God's grace. And you begin to say, well, my life is pretty much a catastrophe. And frankly, I know some Christians whose life is pretty much a catastrophe. And it may be because of illness. It might be because of an accident. It might be because of, 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 of an employment or financial situation. It might be for a number of different reasons that were not necessarily uh, the result of their own choices. Some are, but many aren't. At any rate, he says, we have this lively hope. This lively hope, I'm leading into number two, but he says, this hope is, and I'll just list it to you quickly, A, B, C, and D, in number one of your outline, if you use it at all, and you don't necessarily need to, but it helps to keep me somewhat straight and focused. We have a call. The Holy One called me. As we look at these first few verses in chapter one, it's the Holy One of God who called me. Does that give me a hope? Does that give you a hope? Whoa. If you remember when you first met your spouse, for those of you who are married, and, and you agreed to get married, that's, 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 that's how the feeling should be. I don't know about you, but in my house, the evening is the best time in the world. Mornings are kind of crazy because I'm always doing something. I wake up, I gotta go do something. I just can't sit, you know. It's still dark out, and my, my wife will come down an hour or so later and she'll say, what are you doing out there in the dark? I was working in the garage. <laughs> what are you doing in the garage? Well, I'm such a slob, I'll never get cleaned up. But the evenings are the best time because we just sit there. And it is a lively relationship. We don't talk necessarily all the time, but it's lively, it's comfortable, it's easy, it's sometimes challenging. When she tells me, well, you know this lady who lives in that third house from the left of the green shutters over there on that other road? You know her name, well, her sister-in-law. Now, you know her because, and I'm, I just shut down. I do. But it is a pleasant experience to be with a woman. And we treasure that time. I, just as we ought to treasure our time with Christ, it is the sweetest part of our day. It fills us with hope that just overflows, is so abundant, is so good, is so sweet. You just taste and see the Lord is good. He caused us to be born again. He calls us as his children. He gives us new sight. New birth overcomes our spiritual blindness and ignorance. We can look at our predicament and say, oh, poor woe is me. But God gives us the eyes to say, but there's more. You don't see it all, but there is more. I can't expect you to see it all, but trust me, there is more. That's the hope you have. That God's got you under his wings. That you are sheltered under the shadow of his wings. When life seems the hardest, the most difficult, and the most painful. When bad news, I always keep coming back to bad news. I guess maybe give the idea I love her. She drives me nuts, but I love her. Uh, she's driving me more nuts these days. But uh, uh, I do love her. Uh, when she crashed, her car Nine years ago, sometimes it's hard to keep track of when she crashed and why, because she's done it so frequently. But when she crashed that car that had almost killed herself, it was like, God, I'm not going to function without her. I know you know better, but it'll take a miracle. I don't want to be without her. And, and God somehow saved her. A number of doctors said that looking at her subsequent to that accident, they had no idea how she survived. She should probably have died almost before she got into the ambulance, and most certainly when she got into the ambulance because her, her lung was punctured and she was suffocating. So God's hand is in these things, and he saw more than I could see, and he does in every situation, every situation. 
that fills me with hope, a lively hope. God, I don't get this. Why are you putting us through this? Why are we enduring? Why are we tempted? Why are we in trials? Because God knows what's best for us. And they're there for a reason, and it's a lively hope. I will trust Him at all times. Amen? I will hope in the Lord Jesus Christ at all times. And when pastor says, I hope he put you out of work. I'm hoping the same thing because I want to see this place thrive. And so do you. And it's not an idle hope. Why isn't it? Because our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father who will accomplish His sovereign purposes here even if we can't see it in the midst of some of our trials and struggles. He will. He gives us a new desire. He gives us a desire to know this word inside and out. Some of you do know it. I'm going to admit it and unbashfully. Some of you know this word far better than I do. I'm sure there are people. I'm sure Pastor knows it better than I do. I have a hunch Marla knows it better than I do. That means my hunch. And there are others. But this is such a thing. This is such a powerful thing to have a lively hope. Now, I know I went backwards in this passage today. And I didn't gain an ounce of ground on it. You all right with that? I just did not gain an ounce of ground on it. We're not going to get out of chapter one. But because what we're looking at with hope leads to holiness. And that is critical. If you have a hope, a lively hope that leads to holiness, we need to know what that means. You know the word holiness occurs, or some form of it occurs, 900 plus times in the scriptures. Anything that occurs that many times, we probably ought to be paying attention. Probably. I don't always want to hear about holy. I'd rather be like, okay, God, you saved me to set me free. You're talking about this in Sunday school. Let me go. I'll do what I want. Because grace covers it all, right? It's amazing. Anyway, I'm, I'm excited. I agree with Pastor, and mostly I agree with what Marlo said to begin our whole time together. I hope is in the Lord. And my trust, my prayer, is that everyone sitting here has put their trust in the Lord. And if you haven't, would you, would you come before Christ and say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. I come before you as the only one who can give me eternal hope. Confess your sin and say, I receive you, Jesus, as Savior. Let's pray together. Father, we bless your name. We thank you so much for your word. It's just so, so powerful, so exciting. I thank you for Peter, that for all the goof-ups he did in his life, all for the, for the sin in his life, and he could write this letter that he just trans transcribes it from you as you breathed into him. They're your holy words, but you use Peter, of all people, to talk about a lively hope, about holiness, about justice. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you've communicated with us, with people, us, your people, and that you continue to grow us as we fall more deeply in love with you. I'm, I'm a Marlow this morning, Father, and I think everybody else in here is too. My hope is in the Lord. Amen.
uh, sign-up sheet for some of the possibles in the back. Um, now we're up to four, so if I wrote down three in parenthesis, we really need four of each of those items. Uh, I'll make sure the turkeys are purchased that are appropriate to the size of the family, or individuals we're giving them to, so we don't spend money on turkeys that one or two people won't eat. Um, but if you would bring those, if you've signed up for them, bring that next Sunday. There'll be a box in the back. You can just put them in the box. And Babs and I, unless somebody else wants to help distribute them, <coughs> we'll distribute them next Monday. Not this Monday, but next Monday. So you got an idea. There are probably going to be some others who might need a basket, and that's okay. We'll, we'll fill them out as we find out about more. Thank you for your support. You're such gracious and hospitable people. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace toward us. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's hard to keep a lively hope to yourself. And if our hope isn't lively, we probably haven't shared that hope with very many people. Because a lively thing means it's pretty excitable. It's pretty praiseworthy pretty noteworthy, it's pretty bold. Help us to be like Alice. We pray for her today, alone in the hospital. I pray that you continue to send to her Christian nurses, Christian nurse trainees, Christian physical therapists, Christian doctors. And if they're not Christian, she'll come right out and ask them, do you know Jesus? Oh, oh. Thank you for that little girl, Spencer, physical therapist, who said, yes, I know Jesus. Alice grabbed right a hold of her, pulled her right on top of the bed, and gave her the biggest, longest old hug. Father, she was so happy that Spencer knew Jesus. She asked everyone that came into her room, help us to be like Alice. Thank you, Jesus. She has such a lively hope. It's irrepressible, even in the hospital bed. We pray for us this week, even as we come back together again on Tuesday for our business meeting. We pray you will uh, bring us back together safely and with great joy as we rejoice that Jesus Christ is our Savior and our King in our lives and in this church. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.